Welcome back to Storytime. In today's episode, we're going to be continuing our reading of Machines and Men. But before we jump into today's episode, let me give just a quick reminder. This is a community effort, and if you would like to submit stories for Storytime, they can be submitted on the Creant World Reddit at r slash Creant World using the flare Storytime. Today's episode comes with a trigger warning that if you are sensitive, that you may want to consider skipping this one, as it does discuss ideas of depression and suicide. Viewer discretion is advised. And now, Chapter 19, The Burden of Memory. Vera's condition did not improve over the coming days. She seemed to have withdrawn into herself completely, and nothing Andy could say or do could shake her. When she spoke, which was seldom, it was very dull and in monosyllables, and when she moved it was stiff and mechanical and lifeless. Andy was certain that if the third Asmavian law, that a robot must protect its own existence at all costs unless doing so would violate the first two laws, was the only thing that was keeping her from shutting down completely, and that she would never have moved at all if it was not required for her to absorb sunlight. As it was, she would stand, move to the window, absorb enough sunlight to keep functioning, and then would return to her seat. It was heartbreaking to see her like this, especially when Andy had seen her smile and laugh and so full of life. Nothing he did made any difference to Vera, though. She was unreachable, locked inside her positronic prison. Finally, Andy couldn't stand it anymore. It was bad enough that he was stuck with Vera, but he also had to watch the awkward beginnings of Stephen and Meg's relationship. In the end, he approached Stephen straight out. It was at least some comfort to know that Stephen was just as distressed about the news of Vera's decline as he was. Perhaps it was just his kind nature, and perhaps he was projecting onto the robot, but Andy couldn't help but feel sorry for Vera. Her current state was so horrible to watch that he had no doubt that it would be kinder to just put her out of her misery. I don't know, man. It's like the third law is all that's keeping her going, Andy explained over the phone to Stephen when he could bear it no longer. She's so lifeless now. Well, to be fair, she was always lifeless. I mean, she is a machine, Stephen said evasively. Dude, you know what I mean. Everything that made Vera Vera is gone. All she does is sit there all day long. She has no purpose in living anymore. What are we going to do about this? She's your creation. You have to do something. I can't get through to her. Oh, I'll come around tonight, Stephen promised before hanging up. True to his word, Stephen stopped by Andy's house that evening. Vera was slumped in her usual chair when he came in, her eyes staring unblinkingly at the wall, her body slack. When Stephen walked in, though, a miraculous change came over her. She blinked, her shoulders began rising and falling with her simulated breath again, and she stood. She took two steps forward before she stopped, the hug which she was clearly intending to enfold him in falling apart. Faltering, she let her arms hang down to her sides. For a long moment, nobody spoke. It was obvious to both men that Vera wanted nothing so badly as to take Stephen in her arms, to tell him how much she had missed him, how much she loved him, but she knew that wasn't what he wanted. So she stood awkwardly, wavering on the spot. Hi, she said finally, still looking at Stephen with such obvious longing that a blind person could see it. Hi, Vera, Stephen said wistfully. It hurt him to see how much she wanted to be with him. He knew that feeling all too well, and it sucked. But time, the great healer, meant nothing to Vera. It would never dull her love or desire for him. She could never forget him. She would never forget what he looked like or sounded like. It was permanently etched in her consciousness, and it was this realization that made the encounter really sting. Stephen knew that she loved him, loved him more than any human woman ever could, and he was the instrument of her torment. Stephen sat on the couch, and immediately Vera moved to sit next to him. She was mid-sit before she paused, straightened, and sat down in one of the armchairs instead. Even then, it was obvious that she was forcing herself to keep a distance from him. She was sitting poised as if ready to pounce on the edge of her seat, her hands clasped tightly in her lap. So, um, what's new? Stephen asked rather lamely. Nothing, Vera responded, a tinge of sadness in her voice. I, I don't know what to do with myself now that... She broke off and hung her head as if ashamed of what she was saying. 
A moment later, she brought her head back up and plastered a warm and inviting smile on her face. How are you doing? How's your job? She asked cheerfully. Great, Stephen said, trying to smile himself but failing. He didn't feel much like smiling just then. He felt like a louse. Really great for her. Thanks for asking. There was a protracted pause while Stephen thought of something to say, and Vera just watched him in admiration. Stephen felt awful. What had he done? Poor Vera. The signs that she wasn't over him were obvious, and he didn't know how to deal with that. He was so sorry. It was his own selfishness that was keeping this robot going. Without him, she had no purpose, and without a purpose, there was no point in existing. Vera was his creation, and he had abandoned her. The visit that had started off as awkward warmed in time to a shadow of what it had been before the breakup, but ended painfully as Vera tried everything she could think of to keep Stephen talking and stop him from leaving her again. She constantly engaged him in conversation, told jokes and stories she knew he would like, entertaining him with all the tricks she had at her disposal. She seemed like a toy that hadn't been played with in a long time and dreads going back in the toy box. It didn't matter that it was make-believe. It didn't matter that it could never last. Vera ached for every moment she could get with Stephen because it was another moment that she had purpose. She followed him everywhere he went, even to the door of the bathroom. He knew she just wanted to be with him, to share his space, to have him and hold him, and it hurt him so much he felt like he was going to cry. When at last he left, Stephen beckoned to Andy, and the two almost had to close the door in Vera's face in order to stop her from following them. Stephen sat down on the steps of the apartment and wiped his eyes, making a sort of snuffling noise between a sob and a snort. Andy sat down next to him and put his head in his hands. The two remained in companionable silence for a minute or two, each knowing what they wanted to say, but neither wanting to be the first to start. She, she's never going to get over me, is she? Stephen asked, a tremor in his voice. I don't think she can, man, was Andy's solemn response. Fuck! Stephen said, pounding a fist into the wall of the stairwell. Andy looked over to see his friend. His head sunk between his knees, was silently sobbing. Andy let Stephen cry and politely pretended that he wasn't watching this. Such is the mark of a truly good friend, the person that will sit next to you in commiserating silence while you have a good, solid cry and give the stink eye to anyone that approaches who would dare to ask questions. When a final sniff told Andy that Stephen was done, he clapped his friend on the shoulder and gave it a squeeze in the sort of gesture of acceptance and tolerance that only two straight men can give each other. What the fuck am I going to do? Stephen asked, his head hanging low, his hands clasped between his knees. It's, I wanted a friend, but she's always going to want more than that. That's something I can't give her. Well, I've been thinking about it for a while, Andy said. Wouldn't it be kinder to just deactivate her? I can't, man. I just can't, Stephen said dejectedly. Well, then at least wipe her memory, Andy replied. Hit the reset button and let her learn from scratch so she doesn't imprint on you again. If she doesn't imprint on you, she can't be in love with you. A system reset? I don't think that's something I can do here. We'll have to take her into the Blue Fairy office, Stephen said. Andy agreed, and they set up a date for them to take Vera to the showroom. The two men took their leave of each other. Andy returned to his apartment to find Vera waiting by the door like a dog that smells its owner coming down the hall. Is Stephen coming back? She asked hopefully, looking over Andy's shoulder to see if he was out there. Yeah, he'll be back, Andy said, giving her a weak smile. Just not tonight. He was really happy to see you, though. Vera's face fell slightly, but she smiled and went with Andy back to the apartment. The two of them sat down on the couch, and Andy marveled at the change that Stephen's visit had made for Vera. Where before she was languorous and barely functional, now she was energized. The spark of life shone in her eyes again, and she seemed a wholly different person. Andy, Vera said hesitantly, I'd like to apologize for my behavior recently. It can't have been very fun for you to watch me shut down like that. It's okay, Vera. I know you were upset. I was upset. Vera agreed, nodding. But that's no excuse for how I acted. It's just hard without Stephen, you know? He's my whole world. And without him, I don't know what to do. I love him so much. And and to go without him is agony. Vera turned to face Andy, and he could see that her face looked sad and crestfallen. If she was capable of it, she would likely have cried. As it was, she looked worn out. 
Without thinking about it, Andy reached over and stroked her hair. She let him do it without complaint, though Andy was certain that this comforting gesture wasn't going to alleviate Vera's anguish. Andy felt so sorry for Vera. She just couldn't let go. She was incapable of it. Vera, Andy said hesitantly. He wasn't sure what was best. Should he tell Vera that they were going to wipe her memory? Would it comfort her to know that she would be able to move on, to have a life beyond Stephen? Or would it make her feel like Stephen wanted her gone even more? Andy tried to put himself in Vera's shoes. To a human, the idea of having all your memories erased forever is terrifying. Everything that you had accomplished, experienced, seen, and thought, everything in short that made you, you, would be gone. It wasn't a pleasant thought, and Andy didn't like thinking about it. At the same time, though, a robot's brain was programmed. They had no childhood memories to forget, no life-changing experiences, no great journeys to be lost. Their entire existence was at the whim of their creators. In Vera's case, the only things she had ever learned had been to better please Stephen. Her whole life had circled around him. Take that away, and she returned to a blank slate. The problem was that at least for humans, that a life without your mind was no life at all. And memories were so fundamentally tied to the mind that they were virtually indistinguishable. But a robot's mind was completely separate from its memory. You could remove a robot's memory chip, and the robot would still be able to function and behave normally. True, it wouldn't retain anything it learned, but it wouldn't affect the functioning of the positronic brain. Vera, Andy said again, if you could forget Stephen and go on living without him, would you? Vera paused for a moment and considered this for a long time. She hung her head and curled herself up into a ball, her knees drawn up to her chest. And Andy thought for a moment that Vera may have gone inactive again, but finally, ever so slowly, she nodded. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that episode, go ahead and hit that like button. And for more episodes like this, you can subscribe for more videos every week. Till next time, see you later.